All right, turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel, and we're going to finish up chapter 6 this evening. And this is the last of the narrative sections of Daniel where Daniel has been narrating his own experiences. <clears throat> what will be narrated for us next is the future history from Daniel's perspective of what takes place in the world. Uh, perhaps uh, appropriately called the prophetic section of Daniel from seven to the end. Uh, there has been prophetic portions up to this point uh, but the, the stories of Daniel's life come to an end in this chapter. And this chapter makes the hall of faith. You're perhaps familiar with Hebrews chapter 11. It has been famously called the hall of faith, retracing those who have placed their confidence in God, whose names and tales end up in the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews 11.34 simply talks about those who by faith shut the mouths of lions. This is clearly a reference to Daniel. But Hebrews 11.34 talks about those who became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. But then it goes on to talk about those who experienced mockings and scourgings, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, probably a reference to the prophet Isaiah. They were tempted, put to death with a sword, went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. And so when we come to the book of Daniel, spoiler alert, he gets out of the den of lions. You already knew that. That is not the promise for everybody facing trials, for every Christian or any member of God's family undergoing persecution for the faith. Not everybody gets out. And yet, the hall of faith records those who were witnesses to the sovereignty and the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And certainly Daniel's story in the den of lions here is no different. And you and I have to be aware that laws are coming our way, and in some places already have come, that are pernicious. Excuse me, I don't know what that word means pernicious <laughs> to the Christian faith, laws that are designed to silence Christians, laws that in many cases set the battle lines in different places than we might pick. We might want to say, hey, I'll be sawn in two for preaching the gospel. I'll be thrown into a den of lions for making Christ my only boast. And yet, I'm not sure we'll get to pick those battle lines. You're aware of the Q4 law passed recently in Canada. And in various municipalities across the United States and in various states, there are laws against proclaiming God's truth of one sort or another. Either preaching clarity about what marriage is or clarity about what genders are, these things will become increasingly problematic in our culture and watching Daniel's life is a good picture for us to prepare our own hearts to stand with God's truth with courage and consistency and faith. As we saw last week, Daniel's courage did not come at a glance, one courageous moment out of the blue. No, Daniel opening his windows towards Jerusalem in obedience to God and anticipating the hope of the fulfillment of God's promises, Daniel's praying morning, midday, and night for the people and for the land of Babylon, perhaps even praying for his persecutors, all of that was normal in Daniel's life. It was his consistent pattern. And so when a pernicious law was passed against the very things that Daniel's enemies knew would entrap him, Though he was not disloyal to the king, though he was not disloyal to Babylon, and though he did not sin against his God, they knew they could get him because of his reputation of faithfulness in devotion to the God of Israel. And it was not out of the blue that Daniel obeyed. He just carried on the way he always had. And he loved God more than he loved his own safety. That brings us to verse 16 of Daniel chapter 6. And I'll read verse 16 to the end of the chapter where we get the rest of the story. 
Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you consistently serve, will himself deliver you. A stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose at dawn, at the break of day, and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me. Inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was very pleased and gave orders for Daniel to be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The king then gave orders, and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel, and they cast them, their children, and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. We're going to look at Daniel's deliverance this evening in six scenes to break up this narrative a little bit. And the first scene is Daniel's sentence. Verses 16 and 17 we read this, the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. And then the king spoke to Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. Daniel has been trumped up on silly charges. A phony law has been concocted simply to trap him. It's a law that the king agreed to prematurely. He didn't understand the motives of Daniel's enemies. He didn't understand the implications of the law he signed. And then he was bound by it, according to the custom of the Medes and the Persians. Not even the king could change the law. And then Daniel's enemies went and found him where they knew they would find him, in his upper room with the windows open in his private chamber facing towards Jerusalem, praying. And the same men who concocted the law are the same men who spied on Daniel praying, and they are the same men who reported to the king that Daniel had violated the new law. The king knew he was trapped. He tried to rescue Daniel from his own law until evening. And in the Persian way, the accused was accused and condemned and executed in the same day. So as soon as the sun went down, Daniel's time was up. Daniel here is treated as the vilest offender in the kingdom. He's brought forth as a criminal worthy of a terrifying demise. And yet he has only served the kingdom faithfully. He has prayed for its welfare and he has been consistent in his worship of God. And yet he is thrown in treated as the worst. Perhaps you've seen the lions at the Phoenix Zoo. Have you been there? H have you been there when the lions have roared? That will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. I've seen the lions at Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, and they're a little closer, and they seem to be a little louder. <laughs> it's terrifying. A number of years ago, I traveled to South Africa in a place where you can drive your car between the lions so that there is nothing between you and lions but your car door. 
These are terrifying animals. In the Persian custom of sending criminals to their death by wild animals, these lions were starved so that they they would be more effective as executioners. Listen to the words that Darius utters as Daniel is led to his execution. Do you see it in verse 16? Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Why is the king uttering words at all to a condemned criminal? He obviously loves Daniel. He has a high regard for Daniel, and he is hoping that Daniel is rescued. And he's expressing faith in the only place faith could be expressed at this point. I tried, I failed, your God will deliver you. This is a remarkable expression on the lips of the king. It is possible in the Aramaic to convey this as something like, may he rescue you. And so some English translations convey it that way. I think it is actually more accurate to uh, indicate this as a future, a simple future. Your God will deliver you. What's interesting is... Darius's knowledge of Daniel's God. There seems to be more here than Daniel's mere testimony of devotion to God. Has Daniel already told Darius about the God of Israel, about creation, the Exodus, the Passover? It seems when Darius later on in this passage extols God for signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth, he seems to know more than Daniel chapter 6 lets on. Daniel has been talking to him. Did Darius know about the fiery furnace deliverance of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Had he heard about the fourth being, one like a son of God, walking in the midst of the fire? And and notice the order of events here. Daniel is tossed in, and then Darius speaks to him. That means that Darius, the king, went with Daniel to the place of execution, went with him up to the mouth of the lion's den. By the way, there's a lot of mouths and a lot of devouring in this passage. And it's interesting, there's a mouth of a pit, there's mouths of the lions, there's mouths of the accusers. The literary features here are fascinating. And here, Darius is speaking down through the mouth of the pit to Daniel. It seems that he's speaking to Daniel after Daniel is tossed in. Is Darius here peering down into the pit where Daniel, yet unharmed, can hear his voice? We've already read the passage, so I know I'm not spoiling anything, but you know that Daniel's opponents were devoured and their bones crushed before they hit the floor of the den. Here, Daniel has been tossed in, and then the king is speaking to him. And notice what Daniel is known for here. By Darius' testimony, your God, whom you constantly serve, whom you serve in the continuance all the time, Daniel, you have never relented in serving Yahweh, the God of Israel. This is noticeable. Would this be noticeable in your life? Would an adversary or an advocate say about you, here's what I know to be true of you, you serve God continually. That's what Daniel was known for. A clear example of faith and faithfulness before a watching world. Then a stone is brought and a stone covers the entrance. And and there are probably two different ways this pit was constructed. The the den, the word for den or pit is a comes from a verb that means to dig. So it's likely something sunken into the ground where the earth itself makes natural walls. There may have been a side entrance for lion keepers to get in and out. Uh, There is certainly a top entrance by which Daniel is lifted out and by which the opponents are tossed in. So some have said that the stone is rolled over the side entrance and it sort of makes the whole thing official with the signet rings and the seals. And if the seal is broken and the seal seal from a signet ring comes from a unique ring that only the king has if it's his ring and only the lords have if it's their rings and all of these rings have sealed their seals into the soft clay or a wax seal over the stone connecting probably chains to the rocks surrounding it. And this just lets everybody know that unless you're the king and the lords, this can't be undone. This sentence is final. Daniel is to be tossed in and no one can change it. It's also possible that, this, that there's an opening only at the top and the stone is rolled over the top. 
And, and some have suggested that the king would seal it so that none of the enemies of Daniel could kill him in some alternative way. And the lords would seal it so that they could be assured that the king wouldn't send in somebody to keep Daniel safe overnight. Whatever the case may be, no one was going in, no one was coming out, nothing could be changed, and Daniel was shut in. There was no escape. The next scene here is the king's anguish. Darius, the king, was anguished all night through the night into the morning. Look at verse 18. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting. Now, this is not necessarily religious fasting. This is just he doesn't feel like eating. He went through the night hungrily. And no entertainment was brought before him, and his sleep fled from him. He went to his palace. There was no eating. There was no entertainment. The word for entertainment is a mysterious word. It only happens here. And, and either the roots have to do with uh, musical instruments or with women. The point is there is no regular entertainment for the king tonight. And his sleep fled away from him. This is a sleepless night leading to an early morning at first light. If, if you spent all night as a kid waiting for Christmas to arrive and you just couldn't wait for the first crack of daylight, is it light yet? Well, I don't know. It's not black. It's kind of black gray. You get the impression here that the, the king leaves his palace at the first sign of light and he races to the pit. Remember, he was 62 years old when he took the throne in Babylon. So here is this aged king running to the pit of lions. Literally, with alarm within himself, in haste, he ran to the den. He's been up all night, perhaps with a burdened conscience, perhaps with grave concern, perhaps with a glimmer of hope for Daniel, and he approaches the pit, and he cries out with an anguished voice. Look at verse 20. When he came near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice, a voice of anguish. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? And it seems at this point that if the stone was over the top, it has been moved. Um, or if the stone is on a side entrance and what is over the top is a, a grate or some other covering, he is speaking through that. And then you have the next scene, which is Daniel's rescue beginning in verse 21. It begins with Daniel's response to the king. He hears the king. The king has rushed to the den. He's calling out for Daniel. By the way, if he was absolutely hopeless, he probably just would have sulked in his palace. He runs to the den, hoping to find Daniel alive. There is some glimmer of expectation here in the king. And Daniel's voice pierces the king's anguish. Verse 21, Daniel spoke to the king. And that's just an exclamation point right there. In fact, the word spoke in Aramaic is an intensive form that if we were writing this out in English, it would have a double exclamation point after it. Daniel spoke. What? He, he's been in the den with ravenous lions all night long. And I get there in the morning and he spoke. It's like it almost doesn't even matter what he says next. But look what Daniel says. O oh, king, live forever. He addresses the king personally, and we've heard this phrase throughout the book of Daniel, and this phrase has been used with malevolent intent. It has been used for manipulation. It has been used for flattery. The king's sycophants around the, the palace, all speaking to the king in the formalities of palace jargon, and they don't mean it. Look, if Daniel's opponents could have had the king's job, they would have taken it. And Daniel can mean this phrase in a way none of his opponents, opponents could. Daniel here is respectful. He does not reproach the king. He only wishes him well. And Daniel could give this respectful greeting to the king in ways that the conspirators certainly did not. And notice what he says, verse 22. My God sent his angel. My God sent his his angel. God has taken care of Daniel. Just what the king had hoped for. 
And maybe the king had known about Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. Maybe he had heard about that fourth being who was with them in the fiery furnace. Here we have another being with Daniel in the den of lions. Who is this angel? Well, it is interesting that it is called God's angel. And that possessive gives us some clue this could be the angel of the Lord the angel of Yahweh, God's own angel. The text doesn't give us much more than what we have right here. Is this Christ? I believe that Christ was the one present as the fourth person in the fiery furnace, and I believe that this is pre-incarnate Christ present here. This is his angel, the angel of Yahweh, the prominent figure in the Old Testament who was safeguarding God's people time and again, ensuring the fulfillment of God's covenant promises. And here with God's people in exile and God's mouthpiece in a den of ravenous lions, the angel of God comes and protects Daniel. If he is, in fact, the pre-incarnate Christ, the second person of the Trinity, uh, one who, in fact, figures prominently in the book of Daniel. We'll find out much more about this one. Then this one is the, the very one whose kingdom is coming, the stone cut out without hands that will pulverize and demolish all human kingdoms the final visible manifestation of the reign of the sovereign God over all of humanity will bring his Messiah to the earth. Empires, kings, and kingdoms will all crumble and give way to this Christ. This is the one Daniel has been writing about. This is the one Daniel will prophesy about at length in the coming chapters. And he is here. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah shutting the mouths of lions surrounding Daniel, slave of the Lord, mouthpiece of God's truth. And we're only left to imagine the evening that Daniel would have enjoyed in this pit. The Daniel, or the text tells us nothing about Daniel's night. It tells us about the king's night. The king's sleepless, restless, anguished night. And we have all these curiosity questions, don't we? Daniel, did you snuggle up with the big cats. They couldn't roar. Their mouths were shut. Did they purr? (laughs) Did you name them? Maybe our curiosity goes to what would it be like to converse with God's angel in the den? Instead, we hear about the king and his anguish and his night. The king shut the mouth of the pit And the sentence of execution was secured. But God's angel shut the mouths of the lions and Daniel's safety was secured. God overrules. God overrules as he always does the power of men, the wicked intentions of men. And this impossible situation was God's opportunity to showcase his own prerogative in the affairs of men, his power over creation and his purposes for his people. And verses 21 and 22 are the only words of Daniel recorded in this narrative. Notice what he, said, what he says next. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me. No harm. Inasmuch as I was found innocent before him, and also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. He's not sinless. We'll find out in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel was ready to confess his own sins before the Lord. But he's innocent in this matter. He has been trapped. He has not offended God, and and he did not even offend the king. There was no hurt to the king in Daniel's actions, as the conspirators had claimed. And it became very evident to the king himself, who was actually disloyal to the king, abusing the the procedures of the Medes and the Persians, conspiring to murder the king's best servant out of envy and ambition. And what is the king's response? Verse 23, the king was very pleased. Literally, it was good greatly to him. He was overwhelmed with the the, the feelings that this is incredible. I am so happy. So Darius had Daniel brought up out of the pit. 
Look at verse 23. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him because he had trusted in his God. You get the impression here that with no injury found on him, that the king had him brought up and then had him looked over, ready to administer some sort of medical treatment, give medical attention, and there was no need for it. It was as if Daniel rested through the night in a child's playroom stocked with stuffed animals because he trusted in his God. The theological import of this on Darius's lips is significant. The God of Israel, the God of Daniel, is clearly the one who rescued Daniel, and Darius is giving credit where credit is due. God gets the credit here for what was clearly an unnatural outcome. Ravenous lions did not even hurt the execution victim thrown their way. This is not normal. But then these are God's lions. They belong to him. And God's angel shut their mouths. Daniel was not hurt at all. In fact, Daniel was in the safest spot in Babylon that night. Darius didn't eat all night, and neither did the lions. Darius didn't rest all night, and perhaps Daniel did. We come to verse four, scene, or uh, verse 24, scene four, Darius's retribution. Look at what the king does next. The king then gave orders, and they brought those men who had maliciously accused Daniel, and they cast them, their children, and their wives into the lion's den. And they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. The king spoke, the conspirators were brought in. At this point, all bets are off. The law has been fulfilled. The law of the Medes and the Persians was not broken. Daniel was cast in the lion's den. That didn't work. And the king is doing king things here now. The conspirators are brought in. They're described as those who maliciously accused Daniel. And the wording here is picturesque. Literally, it says, the conspirators devoured Daniel's pieces to tear him apart with their words. There, again, there's a lot of devouring in this chapter. And the king throws them into the pit, plus their children, plus their wives. Can you imagine being married to one of the conspirators? You did what at work today? <laughs> and now what's happening to our children? And what's happening to me? This is serious, and this is the Persian way. It was a disincentive to obedience. I mean, this is a really harsh penalty, and if you had seen this happen, it would make you think twice about doing something worthy of such a sentence. It probably was also designed by the king to remove the progeny of conspirators. Why would that be important? because they might want payback someday if they grew up. So eliminate all the children. Eliminate everyone that could get back at the king for this. This is not like Mosaic law for the land of Israel. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. But the Persians were different. You might consider Joshua 7 and Achan and his family were all killed. Uh, it is possible that they were in on it together, keeping and hiding the things under the ban and therefore all culpable. There were, of course, times in Israel's history where people did not abide by Deuteronomy 24, 16, when conspirators in Israel put to death all of their enemies and their enemies' children. It's not likely that all 120 satraps and their families were thrown into the pit here. Um, that would take a lot of lions to devour them and crush their bones before they hit the floor. 
which points to the demonstration of the lie in the conspiracy. Remember, they they claimed that everybody's in on this king. Everybody has agreed, all the chiefs, remember the three chiefs and the 120 satraps, plus all the governors, all the uh, bureaucrats over the whole kingdom have all agreed that this law is a good idea. Well, they were lying. We know they were lying because they didn't consult Daniel, and he was one of the chiefs and one of the satraps. But we also suspect they were lying because it would have been really improbable in that short span of time to get all of those government officials together to agree to this law and unanimously with accord say this is a good law the king should sign. And that seems really evident here in that it seems to be a small group of guys, a a handful of guys at the top who are envious of Daniel who get thrown into the pit with their families. The Greek historian Herodotus cites the Persian custom and he comments on it this way, some laws are abominable through which because of the crime of one person, all his relatives are put to death. What Daniel describes here is in accord with Persian custom. And we read that they didn't reach the bottom before the lions overpowered them. The lions literally had power over them and crushed all their bones. And a male African lion can be six and a half feet and 420 pounds. With a PSI jaw strength of anywhere between 650 to 1,000 pounds per square inch. Uh, The strongest human jaws are around 150 pounds per square inch. And the lions had one and a half inch claws. And these claws would grow out and the the brittle parts of the outside would fall off or be scratched off, revealing a razor sharp inner uh, um, claw, which was always ready to tear flesh. The back teeth of a lion are uh, like scissors. They're not like molars. They actually line up one to another and go against each other to rip apart flesh. They're designed to cut through flesh, and a lion's jaw doesn't move side to side like your jaw does. It only goes up and down, and it goes up and down to maintain that perfect scissor alignment of those back teeth. The canine teeth in a lion, the the, the four big pointy ones, top and bottom, they're sized and spaced just right to cut between the cervical vertebrae of their prey to sever the spinal cord. And they can aim with their teeth. The roar of a lion can be heard for five miles. The lion has one of the most powerful musculatures of a forebody, able to break a zebra's back with a swipe of its paw. I was in South Africa in 2016, and we went through this drive-through lion enclosure. Does that sound like a good idea? If you've been to Arizona, it's something like Arizona. Okay, if you've been there, if you haven't been there, you need to go, but you can try, you may not want to after this story. (laughs) Keep your windows up. But you can actually drive through and get close to these giant predatory mammals that might just like to eat you if they could get at you, and you drive very close to them. And in South Africa, we were given these instructions, keep your windows up. And we rolled up our windows, and then the park ranger put tape little piece of blue masking tape on the outsides of the window, connecting the window to the roof of the car on all four windows. And I remember laughing. <laughs> what is a piece of tape going to do to protect us from an African lion? And we found out later that the tape is not to protect you from the lions. It's to prove to the park rangers that you didn't roll down your window. Because if you got eaten by a lion in that park, it's your fault. In fact, a week before I was there, an American woman had been taking pictures of lions, had opened her car door to get better pictures, and maybe the photographer in you is saying, yeah, you don't want to take a picture through a glass window. That's going to distort the perfect lion picture. And she had gotten back into her car and had the window rolled down to take better pictures, and there were inches open between the window and the roof of the car. Okay, remember, this is a week before I'm in this same drive through And a lion came up, grabbed her through the window, and pulled her through the opening, breaking all her bones in the process, mauled her, and killed her on the spot. These are powerful animals. 
and hungry too. So we kept our windows up. <laughs> what happens to Daniel's enemies and their wives and their children? They didn't reach the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. And if you have a curiosity to read about lion encounters in South African wild animal parks, several times a year, people get killed, rolling down their windows. You would think they would learn. Use the internet for something useful. These enemies were decimated by these powerful animals. Darius gives us a doxology, verses 25 to 27. Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land. Again, this is peoples, nations, and tongues. That should have a familiar biblical refrain for us. And he says, shalom to everybody. May your peace be great. And like Nebuchadnezzar before him in chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, this king exalts the God of Daniel, the God of Israel the one true God. This king who by law was to be treated as a God for 30 days now insists that the whole world worship the one true God. And, and this is expansive theology here on Darius' lips. Notice what he says. Everyone in my kingdom must fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. And just like Nebuchadnezzar's doxology, when he said his kingdom will never be destroyed, he, it's a uh, sort of a self-focused word reflecting on itself. It means the, the kingdom of God doesn't have within itself a self-detonation procedure. It, it won't fall apart like all human kingdoms do. It doesn't have the disease of depravity that brings to an end every human kingdom, nor the judgment of God upon it that will crush and pulverize every kingdom. God's kingdom is the kingdom that lasts forever and ever and ever. He says in verse 27, he delivers and he rescues and he performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. This is what leads me to think he probably has more biblical history under his belt than what chapter 6 reveals. And he has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Notice his, his doxology is not limited to Daniel's experience here with the lions. It, it starts much bigger than that. And it focuses down on Daniel's deliverance. King Darius here may not be affirming everything we would like for him to affirm. It, it is possible he's st still here a polytheist. But he recognizes that the God of Israel is alive and powerful. We can't suspect here the condition of his heart. Perhaps one day we will know. But whether or not Darius was a believer in the regeneration sense of the God of Israel, his doxology here and his published doxology to the known world and to the empire that he believed encompassed everything is remarkable, and it reflects what will be true of every king and every emperor from all human history one day. Listen to Psalm 138. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Lord. When they have heard the words of your mouth, they will sing the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. There is coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord. There's a day coming where every king will comply by coercion or volunteer freely praise to God. And this is a preview of that reality. And it's a critical one for the people in exile. For God's people to hear this on the lips of a pagan king would be encouragement to them. Isn't it tragic at times when people who aren't exposed to the truth sometimes say more clearly the things that should resonate in our own hearts? The people of Israel were in exile, having had access to the word of God. They were in exile for their disobedience to God. 
And here a pagan king is giving praise to God. What comes in the rest of Daniel's prophecy and for the history that will unfold for the nation of Israel under the menace of Gentile nations, the people of Israel will need the encouragement of this doxology. For out of the mouth of the pagan king, as we have seen over and over in this book, comes the acknowledgement that the God of Israel is alive, he is powerful, and he is sovereign over the events of mankind. Israel needed to know this and believe this. The last scene is Daniel's reinstatement. Verse 28, so this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Again, Darius is most likely this guberu who is the king, the, the governor over Babylon proper that Cyrus put in charge of what were the vestiges of the Babylonian empire as a subset of the new Persian empire. And when Guberu died, Cyrus was still king over this land. Cyrus, of course, was the one who started the process of repopulating Jerusalem and funding the program of rebuilding the temple. It is quite likely, as we sort of end the narrative section of Daniel here, that Daniel goes into retirement. We do find out in Daniel chapter 10 that in the third year of Cyrus, he receives visions from the Lord. We'll get into those visions but this brings us to the end of the historical story section of the book. I want to think about a few takeaways this evening just from this scene in the den of lions. First of all, let's think about the vindication of God, the vindication of his name, the vindication of his own glory, the vindication of his truth, the vindication of his servants. And that vindication not only means that everybody will acknowledge that God is true and that his words were true all along, but it also comes through divine retribution. And we saw a glimpse of that vindication temporally in Daniel's day when his opponents had the tables turned on them. They dug a pit and they fell into it. They wanted to live by the sword and they died by the sword or by the lions. They fell into their own trap. They got what was coming to them. When we think about divine retribution, it ought to make us tremble. There's a comfort for believers in recognizing that God will have his day, that God will vindicate his truth, God will vindicate his slaves. Those who have been on his side of history will be seen to have been on the right side of history. Listen to what Paul says to the Thessalonian believers in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'll read verses 3 to 10. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Paul is writing to the Thessalonian believers at a time where they are presently experiencing persecutions and afflictions. And they're enduring it. This is a plain indication, Paul goes on, of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering. To not back down, to not back away and cowardice from affliction, but to maintain faith and faithfulness in the face of it, demonstrates kingdom citizenship. And he says, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with, repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when does that relief come? Paul says, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And listen to this sobering conclusion in verse 9. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. There's a day coming when God's saints 
will be glorified. And God himself will be marveled at by believers. We will be amazed and thrilled in his presence. And when that day comes, God will have his vindication. He will take out vengeance on those who did not believe and obey the gospel, those who persecuted and afflicted his saints. When you think about that, that there is something much more terrifying than ravenous lions that our persecutors will endure. Eternal destruction. That is a destruction that brings about the, the, the ruin of a person with ever, without ever eliminating them. This is destruction without annihilation. An ongoing vengeance of God against sin. This sobering thought ought to make us pray for our persecutors. To be a Stephen as he is being stoned, praying that God would forgive those who are throwing rocks at him till he goes unconscious. There's another takeaway here, and it is the idea of safety. Daniel was safe with the lions, and frankly, he would have been safe with the lions if they had eaten him or not. Daniel's safety was in the Lord. Turn to Acts chapter 23. Paul has been on a couple of missionary journeys. He has gone about planting churches and strengthening believers from place to place to place. He's been hounded by the Judaizers. He's been beaten up and left for dead. And he's going back to Jerusalem, and he knows that bonds and afflictions await him. He's been told so by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 21, he is proclaiming truth, and he has started a mob. In Acts 22, he stands up in front of them to defend himself, and he speaks in Hebrew, or uh, in the Jewish Aramaic of the day. And everybody starts listening. Wait, he's, he's okay. He's got some credibility. Uh, he, he doesn't hate the Jews. He, he is a Jew, and he's speaking Aramaic. He's speaking in our dialect. And okay, we're going to listen for a little while. And that works up until verse 21. Um, and he said, uh, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Jesus' commissioning of Paul to the Gentiles was offensive to the Jewish crowd there in Jerusalem. This becomes a turning point. Down in chapter 23, uh, he has so stirred up the people against him, um, they're about to kill him. And he says, I'm a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee, and I believe in the resurrection. And he knew that the people who were trying to kill him, some were Pharisees and some were Sadducees. <clears throat> and the Pharisees, and this is the way to remember, the Pharisees weren't fair, you see. They were hypocrites. The Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And Paul knew the difference between the two. He says resurrection, and they get in a fight with each other. And then the Pharisees are ready to defend him. <laughs> And then the Romans come down and try to get him out of the crowd. Verse 11 of Acts 23 is interesting. Uh, actually, verse 10. A great dissension was developing. The commander was afraid Paul would be, listen to this, torn to pieces by them. And he ordered the troops to go down to take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, take courage. Who is the Lord? This is the Lord Jesus. Here, here the enemies are going to tear Paul to pieces, and the Lord stands by his side and says, take courage, and informs him he's got to give testimony to the gospel in Rome, so he can't die in Jerusalem. I'll turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I think Paul is reflecting on these moments at the very end of his life. And he says this in 2 Timothy 4, 17. Uh, we'll go back to verse 16. At my defense, no one supported me, all deserted me. <laughs> May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That's what we just read about. So that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And listen to how Paul describes it. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. 
This brings back Danielic imagery. <laughs> Enemies wanted to tear him to pieces. The Lord stood with him. He's rescued out of the lion's mouth. And then notice verse 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. How would Paul get safely to the Lord's heavenly kingdom? By martyrdom, by his own death. He wasn't going to be rescued from every lion, but he was going to be brought safely home. Rescued in the sense of ultimately brought into the Lord's presence and away from his enemies. He, of course, would die, did die. What does it mean to be safe with the Lord. It means whatever happens, whatever persecutions come, if you are in him, it is well with you and you are safe in him. One last takeaway. Put yourself for a moment this evening in the shoes of Daniel's opponents, the chiefs, the satraps, the, th the two and the 120. Those who were envious particularly of Daniel's position and his gifts their envy led them to conspiracy. They conspired to murder just to get one rung up the corporate ladder. I want a great job. That guy's in my way. Kill him to get prestige, power, money, fame, to have their ambitions realized and to gain the world, their little slice of the world they thought they really wanted. What would it profit a man? to off his enemy, get his job, and gain his world, and yet forfeit his soul. In the short run, the enemies of Daniel won. It was a very short run. Then they met the lions, and then they met the lion's maker. They met the lion of the tribe of Judah, Daniel's protector. The triumph of the wicked is short-lived and eternally regrettable. As we think about this scene tonight, think about your own life. Are you putting Christ at a distance? Have you stiff-armed the Lord so for a little while just to get your little slice of the world? Have you committed murder in your heart? hated others to get what you want. Conspiracies and manipulations. Are you seeking after the things that can only at most give you a split second win that is no win at all and forfeit your soul? Look, it doesn't matter what you were to gain in this world by rejecting Christ. He's the owner of all of it and he will hold you accountable for rejecting him. Whose side of history are you on? Are you with the conspirators? Or are you with the God of Daniel? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you, the conquering lion of Judah, came as a lamb to be slain for sin. That you took on yourself the sins of all who would believe, all who would place their faith in you for salvation. And you were crushed for our iniquities, pierced for our transgressions. The punishment that brought us peace was upon you, and by your wounds we are healed. We all like sheep go astray, each of us to his own way. But your Father, God of heaven, was pleased to crush you placing our sins on you that you might justify the many. Oh, Lord Jesus, it is good to belong to you. Whatever trials and tribulations and persecutions and afflictions you see fit to allow in our lives, may we only count it as good. May we only count them as servants of your sovereign hand in our lives to refine us, perhaps to put the testimony of your goodness and the truth and power of the gospel on display before a watching world through our suffering. Whatever you would be pleased to do through us, oh God, let us be consistent 
and courageous, full of faith and faithful. And we ask it by your strength and by your grace for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.